from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's installment of Still Growing. I hope everyone's finding a few moments between the rain and the cold and the cloudy skies to get their garden time in. I know yesterday I did a walk around and noticed that my iris are blooming, my clematis have buds, and it looks like I have a few fountains that are going to need some new pumps this year. There's always something to do. The baby robins on my front porch are doing great. They're nine days old. And as many of you know from my blog, I have a mother robin who built her nest on a shelf not two feet from my front door. So now I have these four starlings, just the sweetest things for neighbors. And they just opened their eyes about two days ago. And the parents are spending all their time finding food and feeding the little clamoring babies. It's been a very sweet part of my spring this year. So today I'm super excited to welcome Terry Chaffer. Terry is the owner of the Oilery in Maple Grove, Minnesota. But before this particular career, she started out as a floral designer at the tender age of 15. And then she became a flight attendant for Northwest Airlines. And she did that for about 20 years, traveling all over the world. Uh, She got married to uh, her husband, Ron, who is a former New York City police officer. He's retired now, but he manages to spend a few days a week at the oilery helping Terry. Terry's here to talk to us about using olive oils and balsamics with our garden harvest, and it is just such a pleasure. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Fridley, Minnesota. You did? I did. So very close to Maple Grove. Yes. All right. And now where do you live? Now we are out in Zimmerman. Okay, we awesome. We have 20 acres out there, I and do. it's nice and peaceful from New York. I bet it's a big change. A huge change. Awesome. And you have two kids, too. We do. Very nice. Boy and a girl? or Yes, I have a 16-year-old boy and a 13-year-old girl awesome. who keep us busy in hockey. Yes, when you're not at the shop selling <laughs> olive oil and balsam. That's, That's right. correct. Yes, I'm there more often. <laughs> I bet you are. So you own the oilery. How long have you been in business? We opened up about two and a half years ago. Okay. It has gone fast. I bet it has. You and I were talking before uh, we sat down here that um, you were one of the first to open up an olive oil specialty shop in the Twin Cities. I was one of the first ones to do that. Awesome. How'd you get into it? We were actually vacationing one time in Door County, Wisconsin, and I kept seeing signs throughout the whole island saying olive oil bar, and it made me so curious. So we finally found it, tracked it down to the oilery in Fish Creek, Wisconsin. And it turns out that this is the original olive oil bar store. The owners of this store had gone over to Poland when they were vacationing and saw how people were buying their oils every day and bringing them home, and they thought, what a concept. Hmm. So they came back and started the first one in 2004. This is something that's kind of a, a trend now that's sweeping the country, is that right? It sure is. It's gone I mean, huge in the last three years is when it's really picked up steam. Tell everyone a little bit about um, where you get your oil. That's kind of what the special part of our store is. When they originally opened up the first oilery, they started with a distributor out in California. It was the only person that was distributing olive oil by bulk at the time, and they were actually doing it on the Internet. So they contracted with them for the first year and opened the stores, and it went crazy. People absolutely loved it. But as they were in their first year, they realized that the government does not do any regulations of olive oil. So they couldn't prove what it was that they were selling because if you buy an extra virgin olive oil first cold press at our grocery stores and things, it only has to have 15% of that press and it can be other oils and they don't have to label it. So they went back over to Italy the next year 
And now we have a family that's been producing for three generations produce our oil for us. So we're the only stores, and there's seven of us in the country, that bring it directly from Italy to our stores. You know, before we get into the recipes that we're going to talk about later in the show, uh, you and I were also talking about olives and, and just specifically olive trees. Have you ever seen an olive tree? I have. I was over in Italy two years ago to visit the producer of our oils and to see how it is produced in the fall. Um, we went over in November and when the crushing is done. So I have seen the olive tree. They can really live for hundreds and even thousands of years, can't they? Yeah. As a matter of fact, we visited one tree when we were over in Italy that was from 450 BC, which is over 2,000 years old, and it's still bearing fruit. Wow. You'll see these trees are all over Italy, over 400 years old, most of them. That region in Italy and Greece are well known for their olive oils because they have the best climate and the best soil for olive oil. But many, many countries, including the United States now, are starting to produce olive oil. So they're actually planting olive trees in they, the United States. They are. Um, California and all the vineyards, a lot of them are now producing. There's a couple of little vineyards up in Portland and then also down in Arizona. Now, one of the things that we talked about was the fact that um, where the trees were originally from, they took much longer uh, to mature and bear fruit. And Spain decided to plant a more um, aggressively growing variety. Is that right? That's correct. Most olive trees will take about 20 years to gain their fruit. So that's why you see so many olive um, groves that are passed down from generation to generation. They're actually used as dowries a lot of times. Mm. But the new little trees that grow are only maybe five or six feet tall, and they will bear fruit within the first three years. So a lot of countries now are using these type of trees so that they can get quick production, but still bear a very good flavor in the fruit. And can they get a decent production from a small tree like that? Um, you do get a good production, but you need to plant a lot more because you're not going to get yield quite as much off of a small tree. Hmm, that's interesting. You know, as a master gardener, I'm always interested in the plant families of the plants that I'm talking about on the show. And the olive family belongs to the same plant family as a number of other plants that are of economic or aesthetic importance. The ash tree, in fact, is part of this family. And just like the olive tree, ash trees tend to be very hard and very durable. And also in the family are lilacs and jasmines, privets, and forsythia. And as you know, the oil of jasmine is used in perfume. But, you know, these are plants that I would not have thought to connect to olive trees. And yet, when we talked about it yesterday, as we were getting ready for the show, it didn't surprise you, Terry, did it? It didn't. And you'd given me the list and I hadn't heard that yet but coming back to it I look at the trees that in the spring they blossom with very small blossoms so it'd be something like the jasmine or the cherry tree would do um, the ash being the hard wood they definitely have hard wood because you'll see uh, different breadboards or bowls and different things made out of the olive wood which are absolutely beautiful they're also the plants that you were talked about have a lot of medicinal purposes and so does the olive tree hmm. so and it seems to me that some of those have the oils also you shared with me about the fast fruiting varieties in spain and we've talked about some of the ones in greece when you think about the time it takes to plant those trees and get them to maturity what what do you think those growers have to do to take care of those trees so that they um, can keep them producing and and keep their businesses going well, most of them now is mostly with nature. A lot of it is with their climate, if it's getting enough rain. Um, in the fall, when it starts in production, you cannot pick olives unless it's 55 degrees or cooler. So everything's done in the morning and things to bring in their harvest that way. Um, the one thing you'll see in, across Europe is a lot of the olive trees have a single uh, trunk. Many of the trunks also have three trunks. And so we were asking the producer why this is. And he said that in different regions, there has been points in time where they've had major freezing in the winter. And there's a certain point that olive trees can't survive if they've gone so many days in 
freezing weather, and they have to make the decision to cut the trees at that time. So at that time, they cut the trees off, and you'll see major areas with that. When they come back, they grow back much quicker, but they grow up with many, many trunks. The producers then go out there, and they look at it and decide which three trunks are going to be the hardiest, and then they cut everything else away. So anytime you see the trunks over there that have three, that means they have gone through a deep freeze at some point in time, and now they they have come back and they're thriving. So so pruning, just like with um, owning a vineyard, for instance, um, is is important to olive growers as well. It is. They go through and do pruning also, um, usually done in a little bit in the springtime. They'll do a little bit of the pruning before the, and then the buds will all start coming out. So a question I hear from time to time is, are olives a fruit or a veggie? I guess technically they're a fruit because they are the edible part of a flower. I know olives are often referred to as a stone fruit or a droop, like a peach or a cherry. However, you know, when you're talking about dietary needs or baking and cooking, an olive is usually referred to as a vegetable. I know yesterday you and I were having fun with some olive fun facts. Do you want to share some with us now? There's a lot of different fun facts as you go along. Um, Growers, as they're producing, if we have bottles that we sell at our store that are 12.75 ounces, it takes eight pounds of olives to fill one of our bottles in the store. The world consumes right now 300 tons of olive oil a year. Italy and Greece have their capacity for their trees. They don't have room to plant any more trees, but they're still considered to have the best olive oils in the world because of their climate and their soil. To get your high-quality olive oil, in Italy standards, you have to bring in your olives after being picked within 48 hours. In our, For our grower, Adriano, his rule is 20 hours or less has to come in and press the olives. Otherwise, he will not use them for olive oil. He figures that they go a little bit more of a bitter flavor at that time. We also have, you will see that olive oil has a good year shelf life on it. And that's because the new season will come in and you don't want to hold your olive oil over much longer than that. That's something you have to be very careful about in the U.S. because of our non-regulations. A lot of the oils that you find out on the grocery store shelf will be rancid by the time you buy it because they haven't sold it quickly enough. Yeah, we talked about that, that uh, olive oils are not regulated, are they? They are not, no. Why is that? They... California has been trying to get it regulated now, and actually last year was the first time they got in front of Congress with it. But it's something that has, it's going to take a long time to get the regulations. And the European countries have loved it because they can send in any oils into California and they do all the mixing. And then it just goes from there into the bottles and they can they can write anything on the bottle saying it's produced in Italy. It only has to be a, a small production a part of that that has to do that it can also say it doesn't have to say that it has a canola added to it which is unbelievable but that's still happening over here so it's really nice that we know exactly where our oils are coming from at this time is that is that the reason why uh the founder of your company was looking for a specific grower so that they could guarantee the quality of the oils that they were bringing into oileries absolutely it makes a huge difference on what your flavors are with us okay where where is the um producer for your olive oil our producer is about an hour south of rome and this area is considered a floral area for olive oil floral means peppery so when you come in and taste our oils. Some of them have a little bit of a peppery finish to them. A peppery finish is considered in the olive world a very high quality olive oil. Okay, tell me a little bit about consumption rates around the world then. What do they look like? In Greece, they consume the most olive oil of anybody in the entire world. Per person, they consume 13 liters per year. In Italy, they consume 12 liters per year. Do you have a guess about United States? What do we consume? Oh, man. One? One liter? 0.5. 0.5. And I'm that's close. not true olive oil. And, oh, it isn't. Oh, it's, you a, know, it's, it's that diluted canola mixture. oil, yes, olive oil exactly. blend. Okay. Now, if you look at the Mediterranean diets, those that have the olive oil in their 
their daily diet. And it's in Europe, they say you should have anywhere from two to four tablespoons in your diet a day. Kids should have anywhere from six months and up two to six teaspoons in your diet a day. Oh, wow. We're now behind. they we're behind. We're way behind. Now over in that diet, who is using it, they have found that they have the least amount of heart problems. It olive oil kind of it goes in and kind of seals your heart to give it good heart health, and it brings your blood pressure down by bringing. And it also brings your cholesterol levels down. They have the least amount of heart attacks, strokes, Alzheimer, muscle problems, and weight problems. Olive oil actually, even though it is a fat and has 120 calories per tablespoon, it's a good fat. You need it in your body, and you need it in your body, especially if you're uh, using it to lose weight. It's going to help you to move things through your body and to work with it. And if I was reading it's also an anti-inflammatory, right? It is. Um, do you have a lot of people coming into your shop asking for uh, olive oil purely for the medicinal aspect of it? Absolutely. You do? Absolutely. We have a lot that have switched over. I've had two customers that have their um, cholesterol levels have gone way down. They're so excited for it. Olive oil also works on our skin. So I have like one customer had had a rash behind her ear for over a year and a half. She had worked with the dermatologist and was trying to get rid of this rash and it was bleeding. It just wouldn't go away. So she had heard to try olive oil and cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper takes away the itch. The olive oil heals the rash. And within three days, it was gone. So you can use it for a lot of different reasons besides interior. You can also use it for your skin and using it for, it's a natural tightener of our skin. It helps teenagers out with acne because it tells them they've had enough oil production, so it works that way. It's absolutely wonderful. You know, they they started with this before Christ with um, olive oil, and they used it for all their problems of medicinal, and it kept working. They would give it to kings and emperors and queens, and they, it was considered this incredible gift to be giving to you and used. And they have kept with it throughout the whole time, cooking with it and using it on their skin. You know, it's that's why you see the European women, and their skin is so beautiful, and they, you know, they look so young, and it's olive oil that they use, nothing else. So it's very natural, but we're, I see people starting to now go back and starting to use more of the essential oils and the regular oils to bring into your life. Yes, well, and I'm an avid herb grower, so I am constantly looking for new ways to apply the things that are in my own garden. How many varieties are in your store? We have a, a variety of oils. In our olive oil line, we have five olive oils that are just our basic olive oil. They're the flavor of just the olive itself. We have four that are from Italy and one from Greece. Each one is completely different from the other. We have an organic, which is considered a very mild. All of our oils follow under the organic standard, but it's very expensive to label everything that way in Italy, so we just label one. But organics are mild. We have a Fior Fiori, which is a very buttery, silky. A Primiolia is one the guys absolutely love. It's very bold, robust olive flavor. We have a spicy Italian, which really picks up the peppery finish. I love that one. That's become one of my new favorites. And then we have one from Greece, which is earthy and natural and grassy. We also have oils that are infused. So we have two fruit oils, we have um, three savory, four herb oils, and two that I consider sweet oils. So there is 16 different varieties in the olive oil itself in our store. One of the things that we've talked about is the fact that uh, educating the customer is probably the biggest challenge that the olive oil industry is facing right now. Um, tell me what it's like to have a, a rookie customer come in your door. They've never bought olive oil before. They've never seen an olive oil bar. What is that experience like? We have a lot of fun with our newbies. They come in and they've generally heard from somebody else or they've tasted somebody's. And they're so excited when they come in and they just know this is going to open a whole new way of cooking for them and looking at things. So what we generally do is with each brand new person, we will go through every single oil and vinegar in our store. We'll talk about how to use it, the flavors, we'll help them do mixing of the oils and vinegars. Everything is hand bottled at our store. So you first want to taste it. And some people 
people think you're kind of crazy that you're going to go through and drink olive oil, but it's absolutely wonderful once you start tasting it, and it's so good for you. But you'll we'll walk each one through it, and then we'll do some comparisons and things like that. Education's big. Once they learn how easy it is, how to just drizzle it on their meats and vegetables and fresh fruit and changing up a salad or, you know, chicken can get boring, but with our oils and vinegars, it, it comes to a whole new life of making it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'll, you'll find so many great creative ways. We also offer what we call after hour classes. Okay. And this, we can, you can bring in a group of 8 to 22 people. You call us and set up a calendar date. They come in, and we go into depth about how to use the oils and vinegars. We go through each one. We talk about health benefits, skin care. We talk about easy use in our everyday cooking, whether it's grilling or in the kitchen or for baking or if we are sautéing. We sample out different hors d'oeuvres and a main um, a main entree, a salad, side dishes, and desserts so that you can actually taste it as you're using it. And that really helps to show you how to use it and send you home with recipes and things. So those have been really popular, and people have a great time at that. And then they're comfortable to go home and actually get that bottle open. Once you open it, you'll never go back. You, you will never go back. You will never leave you, the olive oil behind. You won't. I mean, once you start, if you make a salad and you put our lemon olive oil and our pear balsamic on it and have that, you'll never go back to a ranch or a blue cheese or a French. It's just too heavy. And it's unbelievable the flavor you're going to get out of your salads. So uh, you also change restaurant dining then too, right? Because once people get used to that that flavor and and want and crave that that taste they can't get it in a in a restaurant usually right like that Applebee's is, or what have you that's correct so and that's they kind of schlep it yes, yes. <laughs> it's kind of funny because i can't tell you how many of my customers have a little um salad dressing container in their purse and that's what they put on their salads at the oh, they they, they put it. yep they put the little oil and vinegar in their little dressing container and they bring it with them and that's what they use because they cannot have a dressing at a restaurant anymore and enjoy it wow. so true converts they are so once once they once they learn about it once they become students of olive oil they become complete converts and then they go out and testify to the world about the uh, wonders of olive oil on your behalf huh? to everyone it's I amazing it. i mean i have so many people that'll have people over for dinner and they have something that pretty soon all the bottles are out on the table and they're all doing their own private little tasting and things. And then within two days, those people are all into the shop to get things for their home because it's like, oh, my gosh, I just had this last night. And I can't even believe it was just this. Wow. So That's it's awesome. fun. I love hearing about how you um, welcome groups in because a lot of times, whether it's with your book club or uh, a church group, a Bible study group, what have you, you know, you're always looking for fun things to do. The oilery would be a great spot for for book clubs and those type of events. We, we do a lot of um, book clubs. We do a lot of bunko groups. Oh, bunko! Yep. Yeah, we've had a lot of church groups. That's it's great. a great um, couples night. The guys have so much fun when they come in it's it's kind of funny when the when the guys come in at first they're not sure but they're one of my bigger buyers they absolutely fall in love with it and, and they use it on all their grilling and they tell everybody about it it's really fun to watch but the men have a great time at these parties and you were mentioning that they even stop to get it on their way up to the cabin they do this is the big time time of the year like thursdays and fridays everyone's restocking the cabin they have to have it at home they have to have it at the cabin i I have two customers that vacation in mexico and they take them and they send me pictures of everything that their chef is making for them with our oils and vinegars you know, I will. I have another customers that just came in the other day, and they had rented a house down in Arizona for the winter. And when they went down there, there was our bottles, and so they learned. And now they're customers up here with ours. Wow. So they're all over the world. That's got to be really gratifying to you know sell something that people covet that highly and just have such a high regard for. It's great. But you know what? I was the same way. When I had it, I had to keep going back to Door County to get everything. And then I bring a trunk full home for all my friends and family that loved it also. So that's why I opened it. I kept going back for more. So and you're like, I, I knew that. I it absolutely. Crazy driving. Yes. I love it. You mentioned the infused olive oils. 
Tell us a little bit more about infusing olive oils and why you might not want to attempt it at home. Our producer, Adriano, is considered a master of flavor in Italy. He has an amazing palate for ours, and he infuses our olive oils, such as the sun-dried tomato, a garlic, a blood orange, Meyer lemon, a truffle. He uses a natural liquid form of our flavorings that go in there. So everything is natural and kept 100% pure. A lot of people will think that they can make a garlic olive oil by infusing it with garlic or putting in rosemary or fresh basil and things like that. But you have to be very, very careful infusing your own olive oil because what you don't know is that you're adding a bunch of bacteria into that oil and you could get very sick from that. You have to do it the proper way. And there's a lot of different ways to do it, but you can't just take it off and put it in. A lot of times you'll see if it's sitting in there, you're going to start seeing mold coming on your herbs and mm. things like that. So you have to be very careful on infusing your own oils. So just grabbing a sprig of basil and a sprig of rosemary fresh out of my herb garden and then putting that in a, a bottle of olive oil, that is probably not the way to go and I need to just go get it uh, yeah, direct from you. You do. Okay. Yes. You don't want to have that. take that chance to have that bacteria. Plus you're, it's going to take a long time to infuse an oil that way to get any type of flavor. Oh, it wouldn't even flavor it. it not it much. Take a long time. A to do long that. time. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, let's just talk about uh, what you're selling in your store. What is your best seller right now, or maybe what's your top five? In the olive oils, my top five sellers is garlic is always number one. It's okay. fabulous. I've never had a better garlic. It has a very strong flavor. As a matter of fact, I don't even use a lot of fresh garlic anymore because I the garlic olive oil takes care of the flavor. Our lemon olive oil, which is made from Meyer lemons, that's our second best selling. And people love that because you can do it from anything from putting a little in a saute pan and scrambling an egg to putting it on your salad, asparagus, uh, tilapia, and baking with it. I mean, it's it's so universal. Um, our third bestseller is the Fior Fiore, which I talked about before, which is our buttery, silky basic, which is a really nice one when you just need to have a basic in your home. And then uh, it comes in next would be the rosemary and basil. Those are some of our best-selling olive oils. What is your lightest olive oil? I would say our lightest flavor olive oil is our organic. Now, the thing about olive oils, and going back to how the United States does not regulate olive oils and things, when you go to the grocery store, you're going to see four grades of olive oil generally. You're going to see an olive oil, which is extra virgin olive oil, first cold press, and that's what ours is. And that means they've gone through one crushing and they've been under a cold, and this is your premier. This is what you want. When it comes back through the mash to be pressed the second time and goes through the cold press process again, that's when it comes out and you'll see a virgin olive oil. So it's your second. Now it's lost a little bit of its health benefits at this point, but it's still a good oil. It'll come through a third time. This time they're adding heat to it. And in order, they can't do the cold anymore because they've, they've taken every oil they can get, so they add a little bit of heat. This third pressing will be pure olive oil. So it doesn't mean it's just plain olive oil. It's lost most its um, nutrients at this point. Then it goes through one more time for human consumption. And this time when it comes out, they add a lot of heat to it. And this is what's called light or extra light olive oil. Oh, you're kidding. There's you, nothing in it. There is nothing it has the same amount of calories, but there's absolutely no flavor, there's no color, there's no health benefits whatsoever. If you have an extra light or a light, get rid of it. It's so if not you're a clean. dieter or you're, you're, you're thinking you're doing the right thing, right, because we're trained here to look for words like light and extra light and fat-free and uh, anything that indicates it's been diminished some way, you're actually um, not helping yourself at all by eating a light or extra light olive oil. Correct. You want to have an extra virgin first cold press, but you want to know where it's coming from. Well, that is something I did not know. Yes. That's very surprising. People learn that in our class all the time, and they're like, oh my gosh, yes. I'm going home because that's what's in my cupboard. We've been doing it the wrong way. Yes, we have. 
Okay. And I learned it too the hard way. Um, let's talk about the, some of the stronger flavors that are in your store. So um, you have someone that can handle maybe more heat, more spice, um, or just a more intense flavor. What what would you direct that type of customer to? If they're looking at our basic olive oils, just the flavor of the olive itself, I would direct them more to our Primiolia or to our spicy Italian. Both of that have a bolder flavor, a peppery flavor, so they're a stronger flavor. Great for meats, great for green veggies, bread dipping, you know, that you want that stronger, robust flavor. We also have a hot chili, which has chilies added to it, and it's going to have a medium heat. That one's great. Um, It takes about 20, 30 seconds after you taste it to get the heat, but that one's wonderful on steaks. I do a lot of my green beans with it. Popcorn is wonderful. Drizzling on a pizza is great or making brownies with it. It's fantastic. You make brownies with the hot chili. I do because you get that. You've seen the different um, chocolates out there with different heats now. Yes. It's, you get the same thing but you get this brownie and people don't know what you've done but they absolutely love it and they can't figure it out what the difference is. So if you do something like that, are you decreasing the butter or the the I suppose the the vegetable oil that you would normally put in that recipe, you're putting this in instead. You are. You're taking out the butter or the vegetable oil and you're cutting it down because olive oil gives a lot of moisture to your baking. So instead of using a half a cup of butter or vegetable oil, you're gonna cut it down to about a quarter cup. We have a substitution list in our store that you can Um, look at but you're going to cut it down and the brownies are going to stay fresh all your baking things are going to stay fresh days longer than what you would normally use so it's fantastic that way so it's a it acts as a preservative as well it does and then we also have the truffle and you're talking stronger flavors which is not chocolate but a mushroom it's a mushroom yes that's right yes and we have the black truffle in our store but it is very very it's a strong mushroom flavor It is absolutely wonderful doing it on steaks, fried eggs. We do a lot of take french fries out of the oven and drizzle them with the truffle olive oil, a little bit of sea salt and Parmesan cheese, and it's like you've gone to heaven for a side dish. It's fantastic. The truffle, though, when you pour it to taste it, it smells like garlic. Hmm. And what happens is that when they cut the truffle, the sulfuric acid lets off the garlic scent, but it has nothing to do with the garlic family. It doesn't have the flavor of it, but your your brain kind of gets tricked to thinking that it's in the garlic. But it's absolutely fantastic. We also love to put them into mashed potatoes and drizzle it on top of it also. If I had a recipe that called for lemons, I could use the lemon-infused oil. Or if I had a recipe that called for garlic, I could use the garlic-infused oil and just skip the actual ingredient itself. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yep. That's amazing. The only time in baking, I'm a big vanilla person, so I usually keep okay. the vanilla extract in there even when I use our vanilla olive oil. But oh, that's okay. up to you. Okay. So do you hit it with a with the vanilla olive oil just to give it a little extra push of, yes. of vanilla? Is that what you're doing? Absolutely. Okay. It's a great flavor. Is olive oil like wine, Terry? I mean, can your does your palate expand as you experiment and taste olive oils? Absolutely. You will notice big differences. And it's funny how my customers say now they'll go home with theirs and then they will want to use up what they have in the cupboard and they'll say, Oh my gosh, even the kids said, what did you use? It was so different because they even catch that different flavor now in it. So they, you just can't go back to using your other oils after that. It's yes. amazing. But also your palate starts to extend. I see a lot of people come in and they'll start with maybe our fior or a lemon or a garlic. And then pretty soon they're coming in and trying a sun-dried tomato or a dill, or they're picking up a truffle just to try something different and to bring a new flavor in and expand their, their way of cooking. Tell everybody the story about uh, when you took your kids to a restaurant. Yep, we were there. And my kids back then we were probably... It was probably about two years ago, so they were a little bit smaller, and um, the waitress came over and was really excited because they were now serving olive oil with their bread, and it was a garlic olive oil that they had infused themselves. So we tried it, and it was funny to see the reactions because Matthew, who never says much about food, looked at us, and he looked at the waitress and said, this is garlic? And she said, yeah, what do you think? And he goes, this isn't garlic olive oil. You need to try our garlic olive oil because... 
this is not olive oil. So it was kind of funny. They can get a little snobbish about their olive oil now also. Absolutely. In things. Yep. They, can, they can taste that difference. Well, I love that. Oh. I, I think it's great when, when uh, parents develop a passion and their kids learn from that. That's pretty great. We love to have kids come in the store and taste. I mean, we'll have kids that are young kids, maybe 11 or 12, that come in and know how to use some of the oils because they've watched the cooking shows where their parents have no idea. You know, their mom will go, what? What do you know about truffle oil? You know, she'll have no idea how to use it, but they've seen it because they've watched, you know, the chefs use it in the kitchens and and it's perked their interest. You know, ever since the competitions have been on the Food Network and things, the guys have got so involved and they come into my store and they're so excited to try new things and they've seen the chefs use it and they just want to dive in and try something new and exciting. The education is all around, isn't it? It goes it both is. ways. Yeah, we learn it from is. our children too. We do. Um, let's let's switch gears a little bit and talk uh, quickly about balsamics because uh, for those of us who love the taste of balsamic vinegar but don't know much about it, uh, balsamic vinegar is a condiment originating from Italy and uh, it's a great derivative. And I bet there are some of your customers who come into the store that have never tasted balsamics before. Am I right? You're right. Or they've only had ones from the grocery store which are completely different than ours. A lot of the um, balsamics that you're going to find at grocery stores are ones that have not been aged, and they add a lot of sugar to it in different flavorings to bring it up to that sweet flavor. When you come to our store, you're going to try, and they're made from the Treviano grape, and th- what happens is when the grapes are picked, they're put into um, really big tubs, and they are brought up to a very high boiling, and they take and boil them until they get a little thicker. Then just before they turn to alcohol, so it doesn't go to the wine, it's shut off, they're taken down, and then they're brought back to a low simmer. And after that, they keep aging them from barrel to barrel. They're really, really fun because as they age, they get sweeter and thicker as they go along, which we don't get the grocery stores. So I will have many, many, many people will come in and say, oh, I don't like a balsamic because it was always tart when yes. you've tried it and things. And I'll say, just try ours. Just, I promise, just try ours. And it's amazing. Out of 100 people, 98 of them will walk out with a bottle. And they become true balsamic lovers after that point. Wow. Very few do not like a balsamic. Hmm. I had one woman, she's really funny, she was actually in her 80s. And she had heard about our oil store and had seen it on, you know, how healthy they were, the balsamics. So she came in to try it and she tried our 25, which, you know, they can be very strong at first. And she started choking. She's like, oh, I just, no, 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 I just, I can't go there. I can't go there. <laughs> and she walked around and she was trying the oils and things. And she came back and she says, I got to try it again. I said, are you sure? You know, I said, let's add some oil to it so that it evens it out a little bit. So we went and got her the 25 year balsamic and we got her some lemon and put it together. She's become one of my top customers. She absolutely loves it. So you just have to get the right combination and you, it's just amazing the flavor you'll get with the balsamics. Now the balsamics only have um, eight calories to a tablespoon and the white balsamics only have five. So they're really friendly if you're trying to be on certain diets and losing weight, but they have every antioxidant imaginable in they them. They do. And they also work for people that have acid reflux and ulcers. It helps to calm that down. You'd think it worked the opposite way, but it doesn't. It also is wonderful for people with diabetic. Um, they are able to use our balsamics because it doesn't have the added sugar. It's just the natural, and it helps to insulin controlling. Well, I have a longtime friend, actually my oldest friend, Laura, who is so crazy for a balsamic that I often see her posting on Facebook about something she's eating with balsamic <laughs> vinegar. People really are passionate about them, aren't they? They definitely are. By, our balsamic is by far our best seller in our store. We sell it four to one to anything else in the store. People they have to have it. They cannot go without it. So usually they have two bottles of it in their home, so they never run out of that one. So they never run out. So it's, yep. so the balsam, the 25, um, 25 year aged balsamic in your store is even more popular than any of the olive oils or any of the nut oils, anything else. That yes. is your best seller. That is our best seller by far. That, yep. And then we have insane. other fruit balsamics that are very, very popular too. Our pear 
raspberry pomegranate's been great. We've been doing pomegranate with orange olive oil, and that's been a phenomenal combination. Tell us about some of the nut oils that you sell. We carry six seed oils and nut oils, three of each. Our nut oils come from California. We have an almond, which is a very soft flavor. We have a hazelnut, which is a medium flavor, and then the walnut, which I consider the more robust of the nut flavors. All of them go with the balsamics really well. They all go with a lot of the olive oil flavors, too. Um, sometimes what we'll call them is a triple hitter for salad dressings, where you'll take a balsamic, such as, let's say, the pear balsamic, and add the lemon olive oil and then the walnut oil. So you get these really incredible fruit flavors, plus this nuttiness at the end, which is really, really nice. But the nut oils can be used in so much of your baking on all your meats, all your vegetables. The guys like it for venison, pheasant, duck, wild turkey, because they calm them down a little bit on their flavors, and then you add the balsamics in, which bring to tenderize them. Hmm. Um, But the nut oils are really great, and they have a lot of flavor. The hazelnut's one of our favorite, again, back to brownies, but we put them in brownies and then frost it with Nutella. So it has the hazelnut and a little bit of sea salt on top. And it's phenomenal. If you need something for a party, it's fantastic. And And it's so easy. And I bet people are going, what is in here? Yeah, because they love them. You know, and it's so easy. And then we have three seed oils. We actually have a Minnesota sunflower oil, which is a great oil for, if you're over in Italy when they use their pizza ovens outside, they take and they put the sunflower oil down first on the crust and then their sauces they cook it, it comes out, and then they drizzle it with olive oil. As you'll see in your store, we drizzle it with olive oil and finish off all of our meats and vegetables, always to refresh. But when you're doing a higher heat like that, a sunflower oil is great. So if I'm doing any breaded cutlets or doing homemade french fries or potato chips, that's what I would use. Avocado we also have, which of course avocado are really, really healthy for you. Um, Our avocado oil comes from California. The nice thing about avocado is it goes to 520 degrees heat. So anytime you're doing that stir fry, you're doing that hot cooking, avocado stays there and keeps those benefits, which is fantastic. Um, When you're doing, our other one is toasted sesame, which comes from Japan. This one's phenomenal. This is made by um, a company there. They're the longest producer of toasted sesame oil in Japan, and they've made it the same way over 260 years. It is not like what you get at the grocery store, which is kind of that hot spiciness you get to it. This is nutty, and it's an incredible seed oil. So we have a lot of people that put that with our balsamic to make dressings, and it's wonderful with our orange olive oil if you want an Asian flair on on your tilapia or things like that. It's fantastic. We have an incredible broccoli recipe and asparagus recipe that we use the toasted sesame oil with our garlic olive oil. We have our special soy sauce that we mix the three together with a little turbinado sugar and put it over the top. And that is a huge hit and the kids go crazy. And I mentioned our soy sauce, which we've talked about in the past. We also have this incredible soy sauce by the Maruso family. It comes from Taiwan and they've produced this for over a hundred years. It's made with black soybeans versus yellow. So it's high in antioxidants and your good tannins. It has sea salts. It's about a third of the salt. They age it in huge terracotta pots for six months. And so it gets thick and rich. It's like a molasses almost. Mm. It's gluten-free, MSG-free. And the soybeans actually come from North Dakota, and they ship over there because they have the best in the world. But this soy sauce mixed with our balsamic in any oil, your kids will eat any vegetable you give them or steak or chicken or fish. It is so good together. Wow. I'm going to try that. I love that we're shipping our soybeans over from North Dakota <laughs> to Japan, right? And oh, then Taiwan. To yeah. Taiwan and then back to Minnesota for, yes. for we the cons- oilery. I we kind of consider it a local product. <laughs> it is. It's kind of a pseudo-local local product. That's it is. A great idea. It is. Um, okay, so now we're to the part of our show where we're, we're going to want to get into some easy-peasy ways to use the oils and the balsamics with our garden harvest this year. So Terry has picked these combinations for our Still Growing listeners, and she's going to to uh, give us some very simple ideas for using the balsamics and the oils to turn our garden harvest into fabulous and easy dishes for our tables. So 
Terry, we're going to play a little game. I'm going to uh, mention some items from the garden, and then you can tell us quickly how to make them fabulous with items from your store or fridge or pantry, what have you. Okay, let's start off. Carrots. Carrots, my favorite, is using vanilla olive oil and orange olive oil. It's like an old-fashioned creamsicle, and you just drizzle it. We drizzle everything. You just put a little of both over the top of it. And then I like to put a little bit of our turbinado sugar or our honey granules on top of it, and it's fantastic. Okay. Radish. A radish. This one, you know, radishes can be a stronger flavor sometimes, Um, My favorite on that is to take a little bit of white balsamic and sun-dried tomato olive oil or the white balsamic, which is a tangier, brighter um, balsamic, and the rosemary olive oil and just drizzle over that. Or you can put them right onto your salads with the radishes and things. But you can marinate them right up in that. And that white balsamic gets really tangy on the radishes. So would you recommend like taking the radishes, putting them in a Ziploc and, and letting them kind of soak in there? I do that all them? the time. Do. I do that with cucumbers and, you know, radishes, everything. You could kind of experiment with the kids too, right? And let them take a Ziploc bag and then throw some some produce in there and then allow them to experiment with the different oils and the balsamics to see what what flavor combinations they can make. Absolutely. And the one nice thing is you're just going to drizzle it on there. You're not going to be soaking things in it. So okay. you're not having a ton because you get enough flavor with it, which okay, is great. Okay, so it doesn't need to be a lot, just kind of like a splash in there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, how about greens, just salad greens from the garden? Oh, our, there's so many great combinations on this. Our One of our very favorites is our pear balsamic with the lemon olive oil. That okay. one's fabulous. We love orange olive oil with pomegranate balsamic. That is a great one. Another one we do a lot of is our blackberry balsamic with basil olive oil. That one it gives more of a savory with the fruit. Blueberry olive or blueberry balsamic with vanilla olive oil. That's a great one too for a salad. It's really bright, but you have this little vanilla, which you never think about putting with greens. But uh, it's, yes, I was just thinking that it, it's fantastic. I love the vanilla with the pear and the raspberry on salads. There's all kinds of different things. If you want a salad that's really really meaty, I use the fig balsamic with the orange olive oil. That one gives you this really great deep flavor to it. So there's so I mean. It, it, salads are endless. There is an endless combination because so many of the oils match the balsamic, so you can have different salads every night of the week, and you'll never tire of it. That is awesome. And, you know, that is something, too, where I think as gardeners we often get in ruts because our focus is on growing and not necessarily on harvest or on cooking uh, what we grow. And so um, it's a common issue that I talk to gardeners about. We're very curious to see things grow, um, but then we're not quite sure what we do with them after we harvest them. So We hear that a lot. And we also hear that from people that order the... Um, the farm baskets where they get a oh, variety like the CSA basket? yes sure. and they don't know what to do with it so we're we're trying to start to reach out to some of these companies to say here we can help you by showing you how to use some of the unique things in your basket Love and that. things like that yeah otherwise it goes to waste and, and it then, does and yeah. then it's not worth it but That's there's right. so many unique things that you really can just add something very simplistic to it i mean even kale is so popular right now and a lot of people are starting to grow it and do different things and that can be very bitter but if you chop it up really small and get it in and add in some of your great balsamics, oh my gosh, there's so much flavor to it. That's awesome. Let's talk about tomatoes. What would you do? What's a quick thing you would do with tomatoes? Caprese always comes to mind, correct? Yes. And if you add the mozzarella, it's really great. My favorite. I know. And our all-time favorite and our customer's all-time favorite is our 25-year age balsamic vinegar with our basil olive oil. Add a little sea salt if you want, add a little pepper, but it's fantastic. And sometimes when we want to change that up, we'll um, take and add, we have uh, pesto that we use. And our pesto is made in Italy by a producer, but it's made with Genovese basil. I have it growing in my garden. Okay, it makes the best pesto, and it's hard to find. So if you can turn your clients on to where to get Genovese, let us know because okay. everyone's looking for it now. But we take this pesto and we put it right over the tomatoes and the mozzarella. And then we add a little bit of garlic olive oil in the 25-year. And it's phenomenal as a little twist on caprese, we call it. 
Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, I usually get my Genovese at the Friend School plant sale in St. Paul. Um, mm-hmm. And they, I mean, they usually have uh, many, many varieties of um, basil to choose from. And um, that's one of my favorites. And another one is mammoth. And I like the mammoth basil because the leaves are bigger. So when you go to harvest, you're getting more uh, leaf for the same amount of plant space. So another fun little tip, but a very good basil, a very good basil. Yes. How about baby artichokes? Oh, baby artichokes are a lot of fun. Um, We we do a lot of baby artichoke things with fish, chicken. I like to use it with pizzas. We have um, an artichoke paste that we sell at the store, and I mix it with our lemon olive oil all the time. And I like to put it on the base of a pizza and then put your baby artichokes on it. And if you want a few other sun-dried tomatoes or some mushrooms, whatever you want to do with a tiny bit of cheese, and then grill up the pizza, it's wonderful on a grill, and you and then drizzle that lemon olive oil over the top. Okay. That's fantastic. Now I'm getting hungry. Okay, how about squash? Squash. Um, two favorites for that one. We use the orange olive oil a lot with that, and we also use our cinnamon olive oil. Oh, the cinnamon Both of those. See. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it just depends on, if you're going towards fall, cinnamon seems to always work really well with that, but the kids tend to like the cinnamon. They like the cinnamon, uh, They yeah. do, but orange is really, really good with it. And then you can add a touch of any of the balsamics work with either of those flavors, but the raspberry is great, or the pear works well with that also. So that's awesome. What about beans? Beans are fun. Um, our favorite is using a little bit of toasted sesame oil with the 25 year balsamic. But if you have kids, their absolute favorite that they'll eat green beans going out of style is with the garlic olive oil. And if you put a sl- uh, little splash of our soy sauce with it, that is phenomenal. So you would prepare them like you normally do. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, that's when you're doing a little bit of a drizzle? Or do you saute them? What I generally do is that I will put them on a cookie sheet or on a piece of tin foil. And I drizzle them with the garlic olive oil. And then I'll drizzle a little soy. And I either throw them in the oven and roast them or I'll put them on the grill. Wow. And just be done with them and just stir them up a little bit. And that's all you have to do. And that's it. Well, and the tin foil, you've got easy cleanup and yes. something nutritious for the kids, which is great. And they get that little smoky flavor. So yes. it's really nice. That is great. Um, let's talk about peas. Peas, a very favorite, is garlic olive oil with okay. a little splash of 25 year balsamic. And then we like to take at our house to put a little garlic sea salt with it. And that's really nice for peas. Okay. And asparagus. Asparagus. Oh, lemon is one of our top ones. We'd love to just put it onto tinfoil, drizzle with a little lemon olive oil, and then any of the balsamics work. And just put it on the grill and grill it up. Another one we love to do with asparagus is take asparagus, wrap it with prosciutto ham. Okay. Put it on a piece of tin foil. drizzle a little of your favorite olive oil. We use the Fiora a lot on this. Okay. Then drizzle a little 25-year balsamic and a tiny bit of soy and just grill it or roast it in the oven. They're wow. like candy sticks. I and you can they use are. it. They are. And you can use it as an appetizer or a side dish. Oh, that would and be once a very again, fun appetizer. The kids love it. That's awesome. Yes. When you're uh, popping, just, just for um, our listeners, when you're popping the asparagus and the beans in the oven, how mm-hmm. long do you usually do that for? You know, it kind of depends on how you like them. Some people like them a little softer some so usually like 15 to 20 minutes at 350 okay. is what most of mine are at so it doesn't take long while you're working on the main no. dish that can be in and then you're ready to rock when it's absolutely summertime. that's awesome how about corn oh this is one of my favorites this time of the year take corn on the cob and husk it clean it all up take a piece of tin foil and drizzle a little of our fior fiori on there the buttery silky olive oil Place four cobs on top of that. Drizzle a little bit more fior oil over the top of the corn and then fold it up and then put another piece of tin foil around it so you have two tin foils. Throw it on the grill for 20 minutes, turning it three times. Okay. You get the most amazing corn in the cob ever. It's the olive oil brings all the moisture out to the top. And so you don't need butter. If you don't want. need butter. Well, you, that's a, that's I a never benefit. Use My it. mom will go crazy for that. It's wonderful. And just a little salt if you want it, and you're ready to go. I also throw corn in a saute pan, and I just drizzle garlic olive oil over it and saute it up. That I like that much better than steaming it or putting it in the microwave. That is great. Um, let's talk really quickly about um, using herbs with the olive oils <laughs> or the balsamic. It's fun. Um, one thing, like... 
talking about basil. You can use that using it with your bruschettas, putting it on your bruschetta toppings and using your olive oil with it, putting it on top of your caprese. Okay. One of my very favorite things is to take strawberries, blackberries, and raspberries, put them on a platter, and take the basil and take and finally just chop it up and put it across the top, okay. drizzle it with our 25-year-age balsamic vinegar, and if you want, just take a very thin grater and grate some chocolate bar over the top so it just gets this little powdery chocolate. I'm getting weak. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> serve it just plain like that as a dessert or serve it right over ice cream or frozen yogurt. People go crazy I over it. Do. It's amazing. Yeah, wow. so you can incorporate it. Rosemary is one that a lot of us are growing. And a really quick snack thing, take some cashews. Put them on a cookie sheet, drizzle with our rosemary olive oil, take and chop up some fresh rosemary, put it on top, and then some garlic sea salt. Throw them in the oven for about 15 minutes at 350 and roast them. It's a great snack. And a fun little appetizer, too. It is wonderful. And talking about nuts, not to get off of herbs, but if you take walnuts, throw them in a saute pan drizzle with our vanilla olive oil and a little bit of our honey granules. Okay. Just saute them up and they turn into caramelized walnuts and you can throw them over the top of your salad. They're fantastic wow. that way. That's awesome. Yep. How about um, how about pairing some of them with fruits? I mean, you mentioned the, the fabulous strawberry and yes. <laughs> berry medley that I'm dying about. I can't wait to try that. But um, what are some other fruits that you would recommend using? Um, grilling season, take pineapple, peaches, or pears. And take and put them on a grilling, um, either in like a grilling basket or pineapple, you can grill right on the grill itself. But drizzle it with your vanilla olive oil, let them grill that way, take them off, and then dip them in your favorite fruited balsamic. It's absolutely great for a side dish. It works really well. Another dessert we do with peaches a lot is we take peaches and we marinate them in a peach liqueur. Oh, wow. And a little bit of our cardamom extract. Okay. Let them marinate for at least two hours to three hours. Serve them in a little dish of um, a little dessert dish with our raspberry balsamic splashed over the top with a little whipping cream that has the cardamom in it. And that's a fantastic dessert with that. So there's so many different things. One of the desserts we're doing and using strawberries, take strawberries, marinate them in a little bit of our 25-year balsamic in the refrigerator for at least three hours so they start to infuse into the strawberries. Okay. Take pound cake that you just get, Sara Lee pound cake. Okay. Cut it up into pieces. Drizzle both sides with our vanilla olive oil. And you can do it with the orange or the lemon too, but we like the vanilla. Grill it, which is the, the, the... scent is amazing with the pound cake. Take and put it on the plate. Put the strawberries infused with the balsamic on top with some whipping cream. It's the most amazing strawberry shortcake you will have. Oh my gosh, it I wouldn't even so want to move, good. right? No, it's, and it's so refreshing. Well, that is a great note to end on, Terry. I can't think of anything better than strawberry pound cake with <laughs> this vanilla <laughs> oil. Oh my gosh. We've been doing it at after hours and oh. people go crazy. I it, bet they do. Yes. That is awesome. Well, I want to thank you for being on the podcast today. This was just so delightful. Um, I want to have you back in the fall to talk about winter cooking with oils and balsamics because you are a treasure of information <laughs> on how to use these oils and just transform your cooking in your kitchen. Um, but quick before we go, tell everyone everyone where you're located. 13551 Grove Drive in Maple Grove. So we're right across the street from J.C. Penney's. That's the easiest way to find us right off of Weaver Lake Road. If we've got a listener right now that uh, doesn't have an, an oilery uh, in their neighborhood, um, how could they contact you to maybe get something shipped to their house? They can just call me direct at our phone number, 763-657-0857, and we'll be happy. We ship every day to you. I bet you do. Um, and do you have any special events coming up? We actually, on June 21st and 22nd, we are hosting a girls' time out in Maple Grove where women can go from store to store and punch a car. Cards at a at stores, and we have all the information at our store. In those two days, we'll be offering a free gift and doing special samplings all day too. And we're open ten to seven every single day. Every single day, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Well, I want to thank you for being with me today, Terry. Um, I will have all the recipes from Terry's broadcast here today shared on the website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six F T M 
S-T-I-L-L-G-R-O-W-I-N-G-P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S-M-A.com. And you can find this episode in the top menu under the Still Growing Podcast. By the way, I'll put Terry's contact information there as well. And there will be some fun things there to reference. And finally, Terry is offering a free gift to anyone who mentions this podcast. Just tell her you heard the Still Growing Podcast and you'll get the free gift. And I'll talk to you all next week. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Episodes and production notes can be found at SixFootMama.com in the top menu under Still Growing Podcast. You can always find me at SixFootMama.com or on Facebook.com backslash Still Growing with Six Foot Mama. You can also email me directly at Jennifer at SixFootMama.com. Feel free to send in your questions for the Master Gardener Roundtable, which airs every other month on Still Growing. Your question will be answered either via email or during the podcast. Once again, Still Growing is an hour-long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Six out. Thank you very much. What's your favorite flower, Emma? Lilac. Okay, the kids are going to read some garden poetry. Emma? The little plant in the heart of a seed. Okay, I'm going to stop you. I need your mouth close to the mic. Okay, like this? Perfect. And then talk right there. Right here. Okay. Go. The little plant in the heart of a seed Buried deep, so deep, a tiny plant lay fast asleep. Wake, said the sunshine, and creep to the light. Wake, said the voice of the raindrops bright. The little plant heard, and it rose to see what the wonderful outside world might be. Very nice, Emma. What's your favorite garden plant? Daffodil. (laughs) Let's do it again. Ready? This is John. A little yellow cup, a little yellow pearl, a little little yellow star, and that's a daffodil. Good. Can you do it one more time? (laughs) A daffodil. You can say this poem's called a daffodil. Ready? Go. This poem's called a daffodil. A little yellow cup, a little yellow foil, a little yellow star, and that's a daffodil. Okay. Can we get PJ? Five little peas. Five little peas in a pea pod press. All right, PJ is going to read the poem called Five Little Peas. Five little peas in a pea pod press one grew, two grew. PJ is going to read Five Little Peas. Five little peas in a pea pot. Pressed one, grew two, grew, and so did all the rest. Let's try it again. PJ's going to read Little Seeds We Sow in Spring by Elsie Homeland Minerick. Woo! Little seeds we sow in the spring, growing while the robins sing. Give us carrot, peas, and beans, tomato, pumpkin, squash, and greens. And we pick them one and all through the summer, through the fall. Winter comes, then spring, and then. Little seeds will sow again. You decided to sing that one, buddy? Yeah. Okay, Will, I need you to say... Will is going to read... The Sun. The Sun. By... Mary Lou Healy. Okay, take it away. 
The sun calls little seeds to come. They wake from sleep and grow. Sunlight is very good for them. And good for us, you know. It warms the earth which circles it. It gives the world its light. When it rises, we have day. And when it sets, there's night. Okay, that was awesome. What's your favorite podcast? Still Growing with Six Foot Mama. I love listening to Still Growing.